Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. God bless you. This time is the time to have anointing. The kind of anointing that breaks every yoke in your life. Every yoke in your family. Every yoke in your local church. And every yoke in your denomination. And that means we're ready to change. Because if I'm not ready to change, if I want to be today as I was yesterday, why will I pray? Why will I study? Why will I listen to any message? If I'm just going to be as it was yesterday, and so it is today, and so will it ever be, there's no point coming. And so everyone that has come, and you have come, even me. I have come. Even those who are in deeper life, we didn't just organize programs for other people, for Baptists, for Anglican, for Methodists, for the other people, which we came so that we can have a greater anointing. In Jesus' name it will happen. Father, in Jesus' name, well, thank you because you brought us here for something good. And I pray that you touch every life, transform every life. Help us, Lord, to rise up with the wings of an eagle that will get you where we have never gotten to. We will do what we have never done. We will achieve what we have never achieved. And a greater power, a greater strength, a greater anointing will come upon Everyone in Jesus' name, confirm your word in every life. Confirm the word in my life. Confirm the word in my own church. Confirm the word in all the churches and ministries represented there this morning in Jesus' name. Well, thank you because we know it is done. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. These uh, three days, today, Monday, and Tuesday, we'll be talking of the anointing. We'll cover such uh, ground that you will, by the grace of God at the end, say, now I can do what I could not do. I can go where I have never been. And I can achieve the things that have been difficult in the past today were beginning with understanding true anointing for a transforming ministry. Number one, you have a ministry. Number two, you want that ministry to be impactful. You want that ministry to transform lives. And it says we're having this anointing for transforming ministry. And then is the true anointing. There's false anointing. You know, some people feel if I can shout, if I can run on the stage, if I can do some drama, then something will happen. That's not anointing. Anybody can do that. We can do that with a natural talent. We can do that with a natural skill. We can do that with the training on the athletic field. We're not here for jumping and running. We're here for the true anointing. Now, understanding it. It's what you understand that you will embrace. It's what you understand that you will believe. It's what you understand you will apply. It's what you understand you will measure. You will gauge. If you understand something, then you'll say, from my activity, from my performance, I gauge what I do with what I understand. And you can tell whether they match or not. So we need to understand true anointing so that we can have a transforming ministry. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm mean, reading from verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely 
the Lord's anointed is before me. Anybody can make a mistake if Samuel could make a mistake. The Lord had told him, go choose and go to the house of Jesse. And one of the children there will carry the anointing and become the king over Israel. As Eliab came, looking at the stature, looking at the physique, looking at his standing, and looking at his posture. He said, surely there's no doubt here. The anointed of the Lord is before me. If we're allowed to choose leaders in the church, leaders in a nation, leaders in the, you know, in the pe among the people of God, we always make mistakes. That's why it's very dangerous for us to choose leaders by voting. For us to choose leaders by, like they choose in the world. Like, you know, we want to have the next president of a Christian association. Like, can. We want to have the next president of a Pentecostal body, like PFN. And then some people go around, you know, I've been, I've been waiting for this job. This is my time. I've been waiting for this. This is my time. And we have some, even people who are not as spiritual as Samuel, they come together. And because we have something in our pocket that they give us, we say, that's the man. And we use bold face. That will be the wrong man. Give me a good amen. amen. Even Samuel said, the anointed of the Lord is before me. God said, no, look at verse 7. In verse 7, it tells us, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance. Looks like that's what we'll be looking at. We'll look at their standing, their dressing, and their approach. And God said, don't look at that. And then it says, no on his height that's what people look at of his stature because i have refused him suppose you choose somebody and you wrongly place proclaim the anointing on him and god said from the beginning i have re refused him and you said i cannot go back on my word i need to i need to protect my self-esteem. I need to protect my honor before the people. What do they think of me? When I said, this is he. And then I come back to say, I'm sorry. What kind of leader will they call me? When you're too much protecting your own personality. Protecting your own honor. Protecting your self-esteem. You say, let it be. Let it be. Because I, I want to protect what I've said. I said that is the man and will ruin the church that's what the church has done for centuries but samuel understood and samuel said the kingdom is not mine the kingdom is his he says the people the nation is not mine the nation is his and if god has said i don't want to put that man on my nation on my kingdom, on my people, who am I to say that I'm protecting anything? And then God said, because the Lord sees not, as a man sees, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh, tell me, on the heart. The heart must be changed if you are going to be a leader. If you carry on with the heart, you are born with. If you carry on with the heart that you have been living with all your life, not born again, not transformed. A heart that is still the natural heart, the stony heart, the stubborn heart, a heart that is wayward, a heart that you cannot see the evidence of the touch and the transformation of God on that heart, God looketh on the heart. And so they waited, you know the story. And eventually David came and God said, that is the man. A council did not sit together to evaluate, 
to find out. God said, this is the man you must find out if you have been chosen as a minister. And some people have gathered together and they put you there. Did we hear the voice of God saying, this is the man? Or are we just there because somebody put us there? Because somebody thinks we ought to be there? Because my ma said, I would love one of my children to be a preacher, to be a minister. Did God confirm that? We need to understand. This is how David eventually came in. And then we have the proof of the anointing. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, And he said, And thought him, and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and without of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Amen. Amen. David had a testimony. He knew God said. And Samuel had a testimony about him, God said. Jesse had testimony about him, God said. And all the brothers had testimony about him, God said. We must have testimony that is sure or deniable, first of all, in ourselves. The Spirit of God bearing witness with my heart that I have been chosen to do this. If I didn't have that testimony, whatever my knowledge, whatever my expertise, whatever my qualification, whatever the ability I have to talk to people and use logic and convince them go this way, if I don't have testimony in my heart that this is what I should be doing, I'll go do another thing. I'll go do my normal profession, and there's no crime in that. But thank God, I have a testimony. You must have a testimony, and you must have the choice of God pronounced on you. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him and anointed him he was qualified to be before the anointing came not the anointing first and then the qualification anointed him in the midst of his brethren and the spirit of the lord came upon david from that day forward this is your day from this day forward god in his mercy will pour the anointing upon your life and then we're told samuel rose up and went to Raman. why is the spirit telling us that because he wants us to know once you have finished your assignment you went for in the house of Jesse, stand up and go back home. Not that, you know, we'll still be talking and while in a wait time, and then we talk out the anointing, and we talk out what the Lord actually wants to do, and by our talking, talkativeness, we reverse all that we've done there. We're talking about understanding the true anointing for a transforming ministry. We're looking at three things here. Number one, number one, we're looking at the acknowledged spiritual anointing that transcends a weakness. We're all weak. Even David, he was weak. Even Paul, Saul, he was weak. Even Peter was weak. But when the anointing comes, there is an anointing that transcends, that goes beyond our natural weakness. Look at number two. Number two is the activating 
of the spirit activating the spirit's anointing that transfigures our work that is working with God and our work a work the ministry we do the work we do there's a kind of anointing that is activated and that activated anointing transfigures our work working with God and our work working for God number three is the amazing steadfast anointing that transforms our world first of all my own world my heart my mind my attitude my courage my virtues my own world all about me then my world all the people around me my family if they are not, it's not good enough for my family. It's not good beyond my family. If I cannot have influence in my world of the wife, of the husband, of the children, of the people that live and stay around me, if they are nothing, it's not worth its salt in my world. It's not worth any salt outside that will. And then after that, the anointing. That now transforms my community. That I go out with that anointing as an evangelist. And then the evangelistic field is influenced by that anointing. Or as a pastor. Or as a shepherd. Or as a preacher. Or as a teacher of the word. The kind of anointing that transforms my assembly. My ministry our world let's come to number one number one we're looking at the acknowledged spiritual anointing that transcends our weakness and look at uh, here we're looking at uh, the reference in first samuel chapter 10 reading from verse 1 for samuel chapter 10 we're looking at verse 1. This is talking about Saul. That's the Saul in the land of Israel. And it says, Then Samuel took a vial of oil and, and poured it upon the head, and upon his head, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed thee to be captain over his people, over his inheritance. The Lord has spotted out Saul. Before that time, Saul approached a submissive person to the Father, an obedient man to the Father, a dependable man to the Father, a go-getter. Before that time, when the father said, go look for the asses, and he went here, he didn't see, go here, he didn't see, we should not go back without achieving anything. The man was a go-getter, and eventually, his servant, he was a listening man, because his servant told him, before we go back, because he was now concerned, my father will be worried about us now, because we have not come back home and we have not found the asses. But a listening man, the servant said, hey, why don't we look for a seer? A seer, a prophet that can tell us if there's anything here, if there's a way we can find the asses. You see, eh, some things that have been taking part place in your life before the anointing comes upon your butt. If you have never been obedient to, you know, somebody ahead of you, you have never thought it should be a go-getter, a vision caster. You have not been the person that has that's my destination, and I want to get there. There is no urge. There is no vision. There is no desire. There is no passion. How can you then come now? I want anointing. If you're a dead log of wood, and you don't want to exercise, I don't want to expend any energy for anything. Be a go-getter. Understand, the Lord has given the great commission to the, to the church, go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. You say, 
say, Lord, that's exactly what I want to do. But I'm weak. I want to get there. I want to go there. I want to achieve that. But I am weak in myself. Those are the people that can come to the Lord and have the anointing. And the Lord said, I have anointed him to be captain over my, over his heritage, over his inheritance. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, we're told, and the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. That's what anointing does. Or does. When we get there, and then uh, the other people who have been anointed, we get into their midst, and we're not a stranger among them. We're not wondering <laughs> what are they talking? Are they acting like that? But as we get into their midst, because we have a heart that is sold to God, a heart that is totally surrendered to the Lord, the same anointing comes upon us and it will come upon you and then it says you will be turned to another man another man that is if you were weak before the anointing comes you'll be strong if you were confused before the anointing comes the lord will straighten you up if you were down before now when the anointing comes which direction will you go? Up. You will get up in Jesus' name. If in the past you're running little and you're tired, you're weary, you're discouraged, when the anointing comes, such strength and such power and such vigor will come upon your life, you'll turn to another man. If you were asleep before, that is all you thought about, at least things, my money, more material things, more property, more land, more of this, more of that. When the anointing comes, you will now fix your gaze on heaven because you are turned to another man. The things of heaven will replace the things on earth. If you are a praise gatherer, you want to gather praise from there, from there, from there. And, you know, if the people don't uh, praise you or clap for you, you are down. If they don't show appreciation, you are down. If they don't say, that was good, we love your life, we appreciate your life, this is great. If they do some lousy things to show you, we don't really appreciate you, you are down for the rest of the day, for the rest of the week. When the anointing comes upon you, once heaven smiles on you, you'll be all right. Yeah. And once God says, that's my man, that's my woman, and that one, I have set him. And he says, well done. Once Jesus says, Father, I praise you because you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, but you have given it to this babe in Christ and to this young fellow in Christ, and Christ is happy about your life. You are turned to another man. That is what interests you. And it will be turned to another man. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it tells us, and it was so. It happened. It will be so. It will happen. It says it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. God gave him, tell me, say that again. I must ask myself, when I was just an ordinary person, I wasn't born again. What kind of heart did I have? I can tell. Now that I claim I'm born again, do I have another heart? I must find out. You know, it's not enough to say, I go to church. Do I have another heart? It's not enough to say, I go to the best church in town. 
that's not enough. Do I have another heart? I am a worker in our own deeper life system. We have state overseers, we have region overseers, and we have other key workers. And it's not enough to say, am I not in the place I should be? I'm a state overseer in deeper life. That's not enough. Do I have another heart? title, position, honor, appellations, matter not in the sight of God. Do I have another heart? I'm the wife of a great pastor. Great. That's good. Do I have another heart? That's what we're talking about. When that man turned his back against to Samuel and he was going and it was so. Everything the Lord had said will happen actually happened. And God himself, not Samuel, Samuel cannot give you another heart. I cannot give you another heart. And no man on earth can give you another heart. God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. The signs will come to pass in your life. Understand, we're talking about acknowledged spiritual anointing that transcends our weakness. You know, eventually, Saul did not abide in the anointing. We must abide in the anointing. No doubt, God said, I've anointed him. And it didn't take long. Here we are in chapter 10. Something happened in chapter 11. And anybody that has spiritual eyes to see will know this man may not keep the anointing. Then chapter 13, Samuel instructed him, go this way, go this way, and do this and that. And he went. He wasn't abiding under the anointing. And then in chapter 15, Something sealed it up. The anointing was not being activated or operated. It was not under the anointing until God says, Samuel, I reject that man. God said, I regret that I chose that man. There are people like that. God regrets that he brought them under this initial anointing. They are not making good use of that anointing. That's how now the thing turned to David. But again, understand, David had the anointing not because he was strong. He was weak. The anointing was to help him transcend his weakness. But is the day for any minister to think, I've got this now, I've got this now, I've got the position, I've got the authority, I've got the leadership, and then he thinks the natural weakness is no more there. And he just go here, go there, go there, and before you know what, it will be clear to everybody, look at this man, the anointing is no more on him. It will be clear to everybody, look at this woman, the anointing, she has position, she has the calling, and she has the prestige that people give, but the anointing is not on this woman. I want you to look at First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 11, well, sorry, uh, First Chronicles chapter, chapter uh, for Second Samuel chapter 3, we're looking at verse 39, Second Samuel Chapter 3, we're looking at verse 39. 2 Samuel, chapter 3, we're looking at verse 39. I am this day, what's the next word? Weak. This David talking, though anointed king. David said, That was his natural weakness. And he carried that weakness on in his life. 
And he said, though I am anointed king, and these men, sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me. The sons of Zeruiah are too hard for me. David, not really, not really. Solomon will deal with them, will deal with Joab. Your own weakness is your own, if of own making that you cannot deal with people according to the word of God. There are some, you know, good preachers, effective preachers, but when it comes to obeying the word of God on Joab, no. They're weak. They cannot do that. The anointing does not function in carrying out the word of God on people like Joab, on Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. And Joab had to say, King David, what are you doing? You're so weak and you're so sentimental. Look at this rebel. And look at what he would have done. If we didn't rise up to save your life, we would have been dead by now. My son, Absalom, if you don't get up and overcome that kind of weakness, the whole of Israel will forsake you. And then he brushed up and wiped away those tears, sentimental tears. And he came before the people weak. There's weakness in everyone. They cannot deal with issues with the word of God. They're so sentimental. They cannot obey the word of God, carry out the word of God. They say, look at this before me. If I do this, they will do this. If I go here, they will go there. And because of that, the anointing does not operate. But we're given the anointing so that we will transcend a weakness. It will come upon you. That's why we need to understand the anointing. I look at my life and I say, what am I afraid to do of what the Lord has committed into my hand? What am I weak at that I'm not doing? Not because I could not do it, but because I'm afraid of the people. What will he say? What will she say? What will all of them say? And that makes you weak. But as we come today, we have that anointing that transcends our natural weakness our spiritual religious weakness in Jesus' name. I go to different places and I preach. And sometimes when I'm to preach, I see things that the word of God will not approve of. And I meet people that the Lord will want them to consider the message of being born again. Because Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here I have a choice that the person who happens to be there that I know, I know from his own testimony, his own mouth, how did you become a Christian? I was born a Christian. My daddy was a Christian. My mom was a Christian. And I came out as I was born like this. I opened my eyes. I was a Christian. I was born again. I said, no, sir. No, sir. A man must take the deliberate action of repenting, turning away from sin, and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, except that happens. Even if you were a ruler in Israel, in Nicodemus, you're not born again yet. And except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise get into the kingdom of God. Now, the natural weakness, because uh, when I was much younger, I was very shy. I couldn't look at the faces of people. And I couldn't tell them, I will know this man is not, you know, the right thing. And this lady is not doing the right thing. But I would dump my head. But the anointing came. I said the anointing came. And now he turned me to another man. I still respect people. I honor people. I, you know, give them good, good titles, which they bring before me. But I'm not shy now. I'm not afraid now to tell you. Should I be afraid of you? I said, you 
must be born again. Give me a good amen. amen. It is that anointing of the Spirit of God that transforms our lives, changes our lives, and then we we'll become another man, another woman. Amen. You would not have known that Peter was weak. Because every time Jesus said, I'll go to the cross, I'll die for the sins of the world. On the third day, I will rise again. And here is uh, Peter. He was, you know, he was uh, bold and strong in the wrong way with the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people like that. They are bold with the wrong person. They are bold at the wrong time. It will not happen to you. And Jesus said, Peter, go behind me. Because you know not the things of God, but the things of the world. And eventually, when Jesus Christ was taken, arrested, Peter threw out, uh, drew out his sword and said, that while I'm here, you will not take my master. You will think the man was strong. And Jesus said, Peter, you're not using the anointing. You're using the, you know, bold face to do all that. Put your sword back. That one will bring you to judgment. And eventually Jesus went to pray at Gethsemane. Lord, if this cup will not pass by me, but I drink it, the will be done. And Jesus came and he saw Peter. What was he doing? Sleeping. And Jesus woke them up. Can't you wait with me? The people who are bold when there is no prayer. Natural courage. Natural strength. Natural ability. Without prayer, they could, you know, conjure some boldness. But Jesus said, watch and pray. Lest you come into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but tell me, you're weak, weak, weak. And nobody would have thought about that. Do you think Peter was weak? When he walked on the sea, how would you think Peter was weak when he drew the sword? If a man can fight with natural weapons, how do you think the man was weak until a lady came and said, you must be one of them. Didn't I see you in the garden and his weakness now showed up? We need the anointing. He said, I know not that man was pointing to his Lord, that man. Was pointing to Jesus, that man. And then another person came and said, huh, I don't know your name, but I know your face. I know you are one of them. One of who? One of the followers of Jesus now. How can you be so sure? Please, don't bother me. I am not the man was weak. He was weak because he was thinking of death. But you had promised that if it takes to die, I will die with you. No, without prayer, without anointing, you cannot do everything you are promising. And then the third one came and said, I think you are one of them. Don't tell me a lie. You are one of them. And to convince that fellow that Peter was not one of them, he began to curse. You wouldn't have known following him when he sent them out two by two. You wouldn't have known that the fellow Peter still knew curse words. To curse and to swear if I ever met him, how can you say I'm one of his disciples? Please, don't come near me again. I am not. And Jesus looked back, and Peter realized, and he went, he went out, and he wept. He discovered his weakness. And then Jesus rose from the dead, 
And Jesus told all of them, Peter included, wait in Jerusalem until the power, the Holy Ghost comes upon you. For ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Please understand. Please understand. He didn't say you will receive speaking in tongues. Don't you believe in speaking in tongues? Of course I do. But that's just a side benefit. Look at your Bible very well. Ye shall receive power if you speak in tongues and you're weak in the time of temptation. And a little girl will make you fall. You don't have power. If you say you're speaking in tongues, and then a little temptation of money comes, and, you know, they buy you over. And now they send you on an errand. Go and talk about your local government uh, counselor and all that. And you abandon the preaching of the gospel. And now you are doing this. And come back to report to them. And they give you more money. You're weak. You're weak. We need power. Somebody there said we need power. And you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. To the uttermost part of the earth. And Peter received the anointing. And I will receive the anointing. I will receive the anointing. A miracle had taken place to start with. Silver and gold have I known. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man rose up and walked, and we are told that 5,000 people believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Pharisees were not happy, and, uh, you know, they got them, and eventually they put them in prison. But they said, tell us, tell us, tell us now, by what authority have you done this? These were the people that crucified Christ. And if he had the old weakness, he could have said, but you know, great things do happen sometimes. I'm about Elijah. I'm about Elijah. So I've gone into history. But he didn't do that. The man had turned to be another man. Give me a good amen. Yeah. Another man. You couldn't shake the person. But the facial appearance of the Pharisees. You couldn't turn him around by the threatenings of the scribes and the Pharisees. They said, if we be examined this day, by what name, by what authority we've done this, it says it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the stone that was set at naught by you builders, but God himself raised him up after you crucified him, after you killed him, bold. And eventually, they put him in prison. Eventually, in chapter 12, they put him in prison again and they chained him to this prisoner, chained him to that prisoner in the night. Our changed man, transformed man, he slept. You know, in the past, Peter would not have slept. It takes courage to sleep. When you know Herod was going to take you the following day and cut off your head and kill you, but he slept. He knew, I'll come out of this. I, 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 I will come out of this. And so an angel came from heaven. The man was sleeping. And the angel had to slap him hard to wake up. He woke up and the chains fell up. Your chains will fall off. Yeah. And the angel said, follow me. The anointing that woke him up, that anointing made the people dead asleep. The soldiers, they were asleep as if they were dead. They came to the iron door. The anointing opened the door. 
They came to the next door. The anointing opened the door. And when he was in a place of safety, the angel did not even say bye-bye. The angel left. Where will Peter go? Peter went to the place where they were praying. Did you know they were praying? No. The anointing will guide you. The anointing will lead you to the right place, the right people, at the right time. Eventually, you know the story. Herod missed him. Herod will miss you. You will search for you everywhere. If you have the anointing that transcends your weakness, you will not be the same anymore in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 27. Isaiah chapter 10. We're reading from verse 27. And it shall come to pass in that day. You know, God always has a day for the one he's going to use. I'll have a day for you. And this could be that day. It may not be for everybody. Everybody may not lock, lock in. But if you are the man, you are the woman, for the reason we're here, your day has come. It says it shall come to pass in that day that the burden shall be taken away from off the shoulder. Somebody wants to run a race and he has half bag of cement on this shoulder, half bag of cement on the other shoulder, and a bag of cement is tied to his back. And he wants to run with other people that don't have any weight on them. Can he compete with them? No. no. Many of us have weights on our mind. We have weights on our shoulders. We have weights in our families. We have weights in our local churches. And as we're dragging on and dragging on, we're conscious of the weight of the load at our back. But when the anointing comes, all that load will be lifted. Yeah. Other people have loads of condemnation, loads of guilt, loads of every time they want to jump at something and do it, the enemy will remind you, <laughs> you of all people, you want to jump, you want to run. The same person so is doing it at his age, I am going to do it. This one is doing it at that age, I'm going to do it. This is the message you've heard, I'm going to get up and I'm going to run. And then the devil will bring the load of guilt and the load of condemnation and the load of pain and pressure. Then the load weighs the person down. But today is the day to break that yoke. To take off that load. If you're serious with the Lord and you understand the weight, the load must be taken away. And it says it will be taken off your shoulder. And then it says off thy neck. Off thy neck. Off thy neck. Uh, sometimes we don't understand. Here comes David. And David said, Goliath, I'll get him. And, um, you know, Saul said, let me hang this on you. In his own case, his own coat. Maybe in your own case, somebody's chain. Maybe in your own case, it's, you know, what they have been using. Daddy said, you know, in this land, I've been here before you, before you were born. You need this. And they hang it on you. And that thing becomes a weight, a load. But today, that thing that is hanged on your neck, the anointing will take it away. The devil recognizes. He knows. 
When he sees us, he doesn't just look at us on the outside. He looks at what is hung on us. He looks at what is on our back. He looks at what is on our nature. And it is there that needs to be broken. It will be broken today in Jesus' name. And it's yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed. Because, 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 no other reason. If in your life you've discovered the things that impede your movement, the things that slow you down, the things you are up, you are down. The things that make you to go two steps forward and three steps backward. If you discover that, it's the anointing that comes upon us to transcend the weakness that will break everything. Now, you go three steps forward, you'll not go backward. Another three steps forward, you will not go back. Uh, again, and every day will be a day of progress, a day of increase, a day of multiplication in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is the activating spirit's anointing that transfigures our work and transfigures our work. You've read of uh, Enoch, that he walked with God 300 years. You know, I've been reading that. I'm now thinking, uh, how is it before Jesus came that Enoch was able to walk every day, every week, every month, every year, 300 years, without sliding back. And I look at the church at large. The church at large. Why is it Calvary cannot produce just one Enoch in this congregation? Why is it Christ with his suffering, his sorrow, his death cannot produce an Enoch in a whole nation of the people that walk straight, that walk right, people that walk with the Lord like Enoch a whole year. And Enoch was not confessing sin every Sunday or every Sabbath day. He was not confessing sin every time. That man was saved. He was righteous. He was holy. And Enoch walked with God. I challenge you to come before God and to say, don't talk about your church and don't talk about, you know, many years. I came on again, forget about that. And say, Lord, and I want to walk consistently in the private, in the public, in my heart, in my mind, openly, secretly. I want to so walk that I'll be like Enoch before the Lord. God can do it. Calvary can accomplish more than what was done in Enoch. I'm looking at Daniel in Babylon and I'm asking why is it in this large, large church of ministers, of shepherds, of leaders, we cannot find a Daniel in their places of work. We cannot find a Daniel in their families that will stand by the word of God, holy and righteous, not because uh, their pastor is there. Daniel did not have a pastor looking over his shoulder. He just knew, this is who I am, and this is how I am going to live. Why can't the blood of Jesus and the cross of Calvary and the death of Christ accomplish that in our lives? The day has come, he will. I said, he will. Because of the anointing that helps us to walk as well to walk and work and labor 
as we ought to labor. In First John chapter 2, verse 27, it says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Amen. Amen. But you know, there's a seed that comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And if you don't keep what you have from that seed that comes to steal, that comes to kill, that comes to destroy, if you don't keep what you have from him, it will steal everything away. It will not steal my anointing. In my mind's eye, I can just see something. I can picture him sitting by that side of one woman they called Delilah. And Samson did not know. He didn't have the gift of the word of knowledge like Elisha had. When he saw Gehazi and said, where have you been? And he said, a servant went no whither. And Elisha said, Gehazi, didn't my heart go with you? When you met that man, when you received this, is this the time to have this, have that? And leprosy came on him. Some sin did not have the anointing that will discern that this woman is coming near and near, near, because they want to take my anointing away. God will give you insight. Yes. Will give you eyesight. Yes. You will know there are people we call toxic people. Toxic people. They have a hidden acid to pour upon whatever gift you think you have. And everything is eroded. But when you have the anointing that can see, when you have the anointing that will know that that is not the way for me, you'll keep the anointing. It says, the anointing which ye have received abideth in you. Didn't abide in something. Even David now, look at David. Everybody has gone to meet fulfill their calling. And David is calling was that he will deliver the nation Israel from these Philistines. And when even Joab of all people went to fulfill his calling and David was not, uh, was not going with them, he was in a place where his calling will not be fulfilled. I pray you'll not make it a habit of staying where your calling will not be fulfilled. <laughs> you know, always hanging around here and going around there. And David saw you wouldn't see the unseeable if you have seen the invisible. When you see the Lord, when you see God, and when you see him, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Anything you see after that will not have serious hold upon you. But David saw that woman washing herself. Well, they are not here, so I cannot ask Bathsheba, a reasonable woman. Are you up to something? Are you trying to reveal something? Are you trying to show? Look at the balcony of the king there. You know he might be walking there. And look at where you, you know, make yourself naked. Are you up to something? <laughs> if I see the one I get up there, because I'm going up there. I said I am going up there. But... They are not here to ask questions. And David saw, well, if you see something accidentally, no big deal. Shut your eyes. That's why we're giving eyelids to take our eyes away from the scene. 
that will not make your anointing to abide. But, and then he started thinking about that. It is what you think about that arouses your emotion. If you don't think about it, your emotion will not be aroused. It is what you think about that draws your senses away from you. If you don't think about it, your senses will not be taken from you. And eventually, he took action, wrong action. Remember, Israel is on the battlefield and the king of the army is over here thinking about something that aroused his emotion and sent for her. And eventually, you know what happened. He lost the anointing. And this son came to him and said, he told the story. He couldn't even discern that Nathan was talking about it. dead spiritually, blind spiritually. And then he began to judge. There are some people that judge other people, but they don't have the character to judge themselves. And he said, the man that has done that, this will happen. I thank God for Nathan. I said, I thank God for Nathan. Yeah. The preachers of today, the prophets of today, they both leakers. They bench before an adulterous David. They bow before a sinful David. And once they give, they get some whatever, money, property, land. They'll be praising David, but Nathan, once again, I thank God for Nathan. Yeah. Now, I, I see many people, they say this one is a prophet, I say true. Say that one is a prophet, I say true. I say this prophet, can he go to Nineveh today and say 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown? Ah, uh -uh, not that kind of prophet. Can he go today to Pharaoh and say, of all our people, not a hoof, are we going to leave behind? No, not, kind of, not that kind of prophet. Can they go to Ahab today? And say, see what you've done. You've made the whole nation to go after Baal, a foreign god. And your wife is your controller. Your wife is actually the one driving the nation. You have abdicated your throne. We don't have prophets like that today. But thank God for uh, Nathan. He said, thou art the man. And he didn't look now. He looked at his face, eyeball to eyeball. And David said, I have sinned. That's the anointing we need. That will turn leaders in the nation around. That will turn leaders of denominations around. That will turn people, no matter their title, and face them and tell them, Thou art the man, thou art the woman. And then a walk with God will be straight forward. The anointing will come upon you. If you are ready for the anointing, it will come. And then you'll go out and you'll walk before the Lord without compromising in Jesus' name. And then he said, you have no need that any man should teach you. But the same anointing that you have teaches you of all things and is and the true and is true. And it says, and is there is no lie. And even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. Amen. Look at verse 6. It tells us in verse 6, he that says he abideth 
in him. You abide in the anointing. You abide in the power. You abide in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Lord has given. It says he that abides in him ought himself so to walk. Even as he walked. Even as Christ walked. You look at your slide and you follow after his steps. That was, that's what he has called us to. And as the anointing he wants to put upon our lives. And he will. In Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 19 here. Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 19. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, then it says uncleanness, lasciviousness, verse 20. Idolatry. Idolatry. Now here we are in Nigeria. Here we are in Africa. Here we are in the world. You know there are people they want messages that they will say, I thought you said GCK is global. Yes, sir. Are you talking about idolatry? You think you are just speaking to the local people here? No, I didn't think like that. How did you read my mind to say I'm talking to the local people here? I'm talking to people everywhere. To start with, a lot of Nigerians in all the countries of the world. And some of them carry the idols of their culture and the idols of their tribe. If you see them, ask them. They carry to the place they are. And some of them even have shrines in the local place, in their rooms, wherever they are living. And some of them have, the, some of them are even writing back home to St. Chakol to them and to St. Talisman to them. I'm talking to them, even though they are over there. Apart from that, I'm talking to Africans. All the Africans in the African country, they have their idols. And when they come, we need to let them know you cannot serve God and idol. You cannot serve God and mammon. Many people also have mammon money as their idol. And we need to talk to them too. So don't say that the preacher is forgetting himself. He doesn't know he's talking to the whole world. Yes, the whole world. Even the whites, they have their own idols too. And the Bible is written for everyone. And it says idolatry. Then it says witchcraft. Witchcraft. They have that everywhere too. And hatred and variance and emulations and wrath, anger, fighting, violence, strife, seditions, heresies. Verse 21. In verse 21, it says envious jealousy that's everywhere and murders that's everywhere drunkenness that's everywhere revelings and such like of the which i tell you before as i have also told you in time past that they which do such things Call them by any title. Call them by any name. Call them by any office they hold. They that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Give me a good amen. amen. And if you have the anointing, you'll tell the people you're preaching to. That's what the anointing does. The anointing does not make us fear the faces of people and fear the actions of people and fear the criticisms of people that now we cannot read the word of God, we cannot preach the word of God. That's not anointing. That's not anointing. The anointing makes us 
to look at the word, preach the word, apply the word, and call people out of those things they've been doing so that they will turn around and they prepare ready for the kingdom of God. Look at verse 22. It says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Verse 23, meekness, temperance, the self control, against which there is no law. Verse 24, it says, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. If you have not crucified the flesh, you are not of Christ fully. If the flesh is still dictating what you do, the flesh is still dictating how you dress. The flesh is still dictating the way you go and the habit you remain by, then you are, you are not one of his because it says they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. I pray all those things will be crucified from our lives. Yeah. And then uh, the anointing that comes upon us will transfigure our lives, change our lives, and transform our lives completely. Yeah. Number three now. In number three, we're looking at the amazing, steadfast anointing that transforms our world. The kind of anointing that transforms our world. I pray God will grant us this kind of anointing. Amen. Your world, our world will be totally transformed. Amen. Look at the case of David. We're coming back to David. First Samuel chapter 16 verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren and the spirit of the Lord came upon David as it will come upon you today. From that day forward, from that day forward, from that day forward, and when the anointing came upon him, what did it make him to do? It made him to transform his world, his nation, the people around him. Brought, it, it brought transformation to them. And we're going to do something. You write that word transform vertically. T R a N S F O R tell me M. Look at David and look at how the anointing he received worked in such a dynamic way that he transformed the world around him. T Teach others unto salvation. Teach others. That's what you did. In Psalm 51, I'm reading here from verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, cast not away from me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy right spirit. Look at verse 13. Then will I 
teach. Then will I teach. It was a king. Then will I teach. It was a warrior. Then will I teach. It was a person that fought the battles of the Lord. Then will I teach. To transform, we have to teach. To transform our world evangelist. To transform a church pastor. To transform our students teacher, the teacher of the world, Sunday school, or whatever, to transform a world prophet and teacher of the word of God, we must teach. It says, then, will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's what we need to do if God has called us and we say we receive the anointing. The anointing makes us to teach. Our is to relieve suffering slaves from Satan's spirits. That's what the anointing did when that anointing came upon him. And look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, we've read verse 13. Let's look at verse 23 now. In verse 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God, permitted by God, was upon Saul that David took an uh, harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. That's what the anointing does. When the Lord has given you the anointing on people have stress or distress, demonic possession or demonic attack, your ministry if it's of singing, if it's of playing instrument, if it's of um, counseling, your gift will release them, relieve them to, to teach are to relieve sovereign slaves from satanic spirit. They were talking of a ascertain the security of the sheep. Ascertain the security of the sheep. That's what the anointing is for. And that is part of the transformation that we're supposed to carry out. That's what David carried out in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. David said unto Saul, Thy servant catch his father sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock verse 35 in verse 35 and i went out after him after the lion after the bear and smote him and delivered each the lamb out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. You know, if the anointing is just to shake when we pray, that one doesn't transform anybody. If the anointing is to run out, run in, and leave the stage and run into the congregation and, you know, shake your head and everybody watch what's a preacher doing. That one doesn't transform anybody, but the anointing that ascertains that you deliver the sheep and you give them security in the Lord, that the anointing that transforms people's lives. God will give that to us. The next letter is N, and is to nurture the sick back to health and strength. The anointing, what it does, first of all, it keeps you healthy 
and it keeps you strong. It keeps you strengthening. That's what the anointing does. If the anointing doesn't revitalize a body, that the spirit of Christ, the spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, abides in you and then quickens your mortal body and makes you strong, where is the anointing? And then after you yourself, you're healed, you're healthy, you're strong, you're sound. Then you also bring that same health and soundness to the people you need so that the sick become healed and they become, they become sound. That you'll find in First Samuel chapter 30, reading from verse 11 to verse 18. And S, S is telling us about you show the sheep, the sufficiency of the shepherd. That's what David did. That's how the anointing transformed his ministry and transformed the people in his domain. And he said he taught them. And he's still teaching us today because he's showing the sheep the sufficiency of the shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want you will not want. Look at verse 2. It says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. In verse 3, it says, He restores my soul. And then He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. In verse 4, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of of death I will fear no evil. You will fear no evil. The anointing makes us to show the sheep in our flock, the sheep in our local church, the sufficiency of the shepherd, that they have so much confidence in the shepherd, they are not running here and there. And it says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. In verse 5, it says, though, it says, thou preparest a table before me. In the presence of mine enemies, thou, thou, Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. That the assurance we give to members of our church when we have the anointing. You're looking for, how do I preach? What message do I preach this coming Sunday? Look for a message that will teach. A message that will relieve them from the oppression attacks of satanic power. A message that will give them assurance and they ascertain the security of the sheep. Give them the message that will nurture them and nourish them. A message that will give them the sight to show the abundance, the sufficiency of the shepherd. Look at verse 6. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow, shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is how we make use of the anointing that transforms and uh, ebb is to feed the souls with scriptural sustenance. Feed with scriptural sustenance. In Psalm 78, it tells us verse 70. Psalm 78, verse 70. He chose David also, his servant, and he took him from the sheep falls, verse 71, from following the youth, great with the young. And then it says, he brought 
him to feed, to feed, to feed Jacob, Israel, the nation, his people, and Israel is inheritance. Look at verse 72. In verse 72, it says, so he fed them. That's a duty. And we do that by the anointing that transforms. We have to feed the people according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Jeremiah chapter 3, we're reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And I will give you pastors, 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 according to my, to my mind, to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. When we make use of the anointing, and it's to transform the people, we'll feed them with the knowledge of the Lord and with understanding. In Jeremiah chapter 23, reading there from verse 4. Jeremiah 23, verse 4. And I will set up shepherds, pastors, leaders over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more. When you feed them with the word of faith, they will not fear witches and wizards anymore. They will not fear Satan and evil spirits anymore. They will not fear serpents and scorpions anymore. And they will not, they will not fear anyone, any man, any woman anymore in Jesus' name. There's some, um, you know, people, they are called pastors. But they're like village headmasters. Old village headmasters with their shorts. You remember them? And they weep on their hands. And those people, those students, those pupils, they feared those village headmasters. Some pastors are like that. And even those who are not pastors, some so-called leaders in the church are like that. All they want is that we fear them. We fear them. No matter who you are in that, their church, they're there. And they position themselves there, here and there. And the things they do. All they want is that all the rest of us should be afraid of them. We're not even afraid of Jesus Christ. We're loving with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. But these people want us to fear them more than we fear God. They want us to even forget the commandments of God and the calling of God upon our lives just to fear them. Oh, you're a real shepherd and a real leader and a person who has the anointing of the Spirit. You will teach the people and you will show the people. You feed the people so that the knowledge will make them not fear you, not fear witches and wizards, not fear any personality. And it says not be dismayed. They will not be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking. Neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. That's the kind of anointing he wants us to manifest and teach the people of God. Oh, is to open, open deep scriptures by the Spirit. Open deep scriptures. And that's what we to do. You know, our members and the church, they have their quiet time, their morning devotion, their evening devotion, family devotion. But there are some thorny scriptures for them that they cannot understand. Hey, what does this mean? What could that mean? And it is, uh, you know, the responsibility of the anointed pastor, anointed teacher, anointed no nourisher to open up those hard scriptures unto them. In Psalm 78 verse 1, 
give ear, O my people, to my law, and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. And let us watch the anointing does to transform our lives. There are the scriptures we've been reading over and over for many, many years. We didn't understand. Now, the leader who is sent to transform us, he opens those deep scriptures unto us. In Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 34. Matthew chapter 13, verse 34. It says, All these things speak Jesus unto them, unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable speak he not unto them. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have not been, which things have been, have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And that's what we to do. We're now standing in the place of Christ. We're not Christ, but we're following him. And we're following his ministry. We're walking in his steps so that we open the hard, hard scriptures to our congregation. R is to reveal the sovereignty of the Son. Reveal the sovereignty of the Son so that the people we are making use of the anointing to reach. There is no doubt in their mind about who Christ is, that He is the sovereign King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What to reveal the sovereignty of the Son. Look at some two. In Psalm 2, we're reading from verse 6. It says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. This is Psalm of David, and it's talking about Jesus, the Son of God. In verse 7, it says, In verse 7, I will declare the decree that Lord has said unto me, unto his son, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That's what the anointing does. The anointing makes us to reveal the sovereignty of the King of Kings, the sovereignty of the Lord of Lords, the sovereignty of the Son of God. And Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you cannot be saved. Emma, this is what the anointing makes us to do, to magnify the Savior and to minimize self. To magnify the Savior and to minimize self. The anointing comes upon us and we make use of that anointing and the anointing makes us to exalt the Lord and then to minimize ourselves. It does that and we're able to go forth and say, this is he. He is not the Savior but the Lamb of God, the Savior, that's the Savior, that he may increase and I may decrease. The Lord do that through us in Jesus' name. Yeah. Looking at Psalm 40, we're reading verse 17. Psalm 40, sorry, 
Isaiah, Isaiah 40 verse 17. It says, but I am poor and needy for the Lord thinketh, but the Lord thinketh, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. That's Psalm. Now we're going to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. You know, that's what a leader with the anointing does. He magnifies the Lord. He minimizes self. It's like John the Baptist, that Christ will increase. We will know him as Savior, know him as Sanctifier, know him as baptizer in the Holy Ghost, know him as the Son of God, know him as the sufficient shepherd, know him as the all in all, know him as the exalted one. And we, as he is becoming greater and greater, higher and higher, more and more, we are becoming less and less, we are becoming smaller and smaller, and we are decreasing as he is increasing. If you have the anointing, that he wants to give uh, that transforms our world. This is what it will do in your life. And you are ready, you are ready for the anointing right now. And the prayer you pray should be a meaningful prayer. Lord, give me the kind of anointing uh, that will transform, the anointing that will teach. The anointing uh, that will release and relieve people. The anointing that will ascertain. The anointing that will nurture. The anointing that will show the people of God that way. The anointing that will feed the souls with scriptural sustainers. The kind of anointing that opens up the dark scriptures by the Spirit. The anointing that reveals the sovereignty of the Son. The anointing that magnifies the Lord and magnifies the Savior and man minimizes self. He will do it. I said he will do it. He did it for David. He's about to do it for you now. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Anointing, anointing, anointing. Having better understanding of the true anointing having scriptural understanding of the right anointing. Open your mouth now and tell the Lord, Lord, I understand. Let what I understand come into my very heart. Let what I understand be reaching on the table of my heart. What you understand you believe. What you understand is what you apply. What you understand is what you pray for. Anointing. The anointing that transcends your weakness. Have you discovered your weakness? You can have such anointing that will transform, transcend your weakness. Weak, you cannot stand for what you believe. 
when some personalities are before you in the congregation, weak. You cannot handle Joab. A difficult personality. So you're checking out. I can't handle that man. I can't handle that wife, that woman. So you compromise your stand. Weak. I cannot stand the rebellion of my own children. So I have to give in. Weak. It's the anointing that makes you transcend your weakness. Tell the Lord, he'll give you that anointing. Is the anointing that transfigures our walk and our work. Remember when Jesus was transfigured on the mount of transfiguration. And a shining of his garment was brighter than that of the noonday sun. Transfiguration. There can be an Enoch today, a Daniel today. We will walk, not faint, run, and not be weary walk in the way God has appointed and no stranger in your life will come and make you waver no persecution we turn you to a jellyfish, to an amphibian, one leg in the sea and one leg on land. The anointing that transfigures our walk and our work. The anointing that makes you have backbone. Strength, strength of mind, focus, bright vision of the path you need to walk. There's no personality here on earth, personality anywhere, coming from anywhere that makes you to shift from where you ought to stand. Anointing. Anointing. That takes over your life. So that human personalities do not take over your life. And control your life and bend you and break you. The anointing that transforms a world. And we need such anointing today. Otherwise, we will leave our world the way we met a world. The world was crooked before we came. If we don't have this anointing that transforms our world, 
after we were through and gone, the world, our world will still be as crooked, as corrupt as the world before we came. Not a, this is not an anointing that makes you conform to the world. It's the anointing that makes you makes of you to be an instrument of change, an instrument of transformation. The amazing, steadfast anointing that transforms a world. You receive the anointing today. You carry the anointing today. And you go forth and teach. You won't allow error to pass by you. Teach. You won't allow false doctrine to pass by you. Teach. You are not allow the prodigal members of the church to take over the church and influence the church and they corrupt the church and they pass on their prodigal spirit into the church. Teach. They're not here that makes you relieve the sovereign slaves of the satanic spirits harassing them, tormenting them. Relieve them soul. Relieve them distracted people. Distressed people. Stressed out people, mental people. As you carry the anointing, as you attain the security of the sheep. If the sheep fear the lion, and you fear the lion, are you going to ascertain their security? If the sheep fear the representatives of those who come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and you also fear them, how do you ascertain the security of the sheep? Not sure the sick, back to health. And strength by prayer, by faith, by the name of Jesus, by the anointing of the Spirit. Not sure the sick back to health and back to strength. Show the sheep the sufficiency of the shepherd. Don't introduce them to herbalist. Don't introduce them to foreign powers. Lift their mind, lift their heart. Unto the Lord, a sufficient shepherd. That's what the anointing does. Feed the souls with scriptural sustenance. Feed them. Feed them. Feed them. Feed them. Until. They are free from fear. Feed them. 
until they fear no man in the church or in the world. Feed them until they fear neither Satan nor man. Feed them. Open their hearts, open their minds, open their understanding to deep scriptures by the Spirit. Reveal to them the sovereignty of the Son. They know the Son. They have the Son. They believe the Son. They have everything. The Son of God. The one that is higher than the highest. Once they know Him, they don't have any problem being cowards and compromisers on earth. Magnify the Savior. Magnify the Sanctifier. Magnify the Spirit Baptizer. Magnify our Shepherd. Minimize self. Minimize self. Minimize self. His will be done, not your will. His way, not your way. His authority over his church, not your authority. Many myself, magnify the Lord. Anointing, anointing, anointing that breaks every yoke in your life, every yoke in the lives of the people you reach out to, anointing. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name you pray. And I pray scriptural anointing, great anointing, irresistible anointing will come upon your life in Jesus' name. And the anointing will not just make you shake and make you shout and make you do whatever. This anointing will transcend your weakness. It will transfigure your work and your work. This anointing will transform the world around you. Amen. 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 And everywhere you go, you live, you talk, you stand, you behave, you act like another man. And when the things that you to push you down, the things that make you that made you tremble, 
in the past. And the things that made you cow and collapse in the past. Those things will come now. You will stand. What's the person I'm talking about? The Father in Jesus' name. We bless your name today for this fresh understanding. For this new understanding. For this higher understanding of your anointing upon us in Jesus' name. Take the garment of weakness away from everyone. And put on us the robe of righteousness. The garment of authority. And the jacket of power in Jesus' name. Your own mantle. Like the mantle of Elijah fell on Elisha. Your own mantle upon us today. Lord, let it bring fire. Let it bring fervency. Let it bring focus. Let it bring the power that stands before the enemy. And we'll just be looking at the enemy and one look. We rout the devil. Yeah. Conquer the devil. Yeah. And all those dagons that will come near the ark of the Lord. Tomorrow morning, when the people wake up, the dagon has fallen down. Yeah. And if they don't understand that we have that new anointing and they set up their dagon again, even without us seeing anything. The following morning, their dagon will be broken in pieces. Lord, I command all your people that they walk now in this way with the new anointing. Gideon, rise up. Gideon, go forth. Be a valiant man. Be a valiant woman. And go in this, thy strength, thy anointing, and be transfigured figured before the people in Jesus' name. Let power go with you. Let supernatural strength go with you. Let this new anointing go with you. And as you come back, even between today and Monday, have a striking testimony. Amen. Go where you have never gone. Amen. Do what you have never done. Amen. Say what you have never said. Amen. The time comes in your life when like Joshua, you stand and you look up at the sun and you say what nobody has ever said. Amen. Sun, stand! Moon stand. And when you say what nobody has ever said, what you have never said, the anointing will carry out the command. Preach. Teach. Release the oppressed. Assure those who are wavering. Nurture the people who are malnourished. And show the people the sufficiency of the Lord. Amen. Feed all the people you meet Amen. with balanced food of the scriptures. Amen. Open their eyes Amen. to see from the scriptures what the Spirit is giving today. Amen. Help them and reveal Jesus that they're all in all. The sovereign King of kings and the sovereign Lord of lords. Amen. Magnify him. Amen. Magnify him. Amen. And his power will be magnified in your ministry. Amen. The anointing will increase your ministry. Amen. Magnify him and Satan will be minimized in your ministry. Amen. Magnify him and all the powers of darkness will fall and collapse and be minimized in Jesus' name. Let the weak say, I am God. Let the weak say, I am God. 
of the anointing now upon your life, you are no more weak. I am strong. I am well. Say, I am well. I am sure. I'm going out and you're going with victory. Be a conqueror as you go. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.